Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're out the range with a new 10 millimeter product. If it's 10 millimeter, chances are I'm going to want it. I'm going to want to shoot it. I'm going to, going to learn more about it. And this is no different. This is the Grand Power Strebog. Sometimes Americans will pronounce it Strebog. I think I was guilty of that in the beginning. But it's supposed to be pronounced Strebog, and I'll try to do that. But if I slip up, forgive me in the comment section. But what's cool about this is it's very much similar to their later version of the 9mm PCC that they offered that is roller delayed. So the very early guns where 9mm were just blowback, very similar to the B&T APC-9. And then later they would evolve the product to where it would become roller delayed. And we'll take a look at the roller system in this gun because it's actually quite simple, much more simple than say the MP5, for example. But this gun's just a little bit bigger than its 9mm counterpart, but it is a very pleasant 10mm to shoot. It does use 20 round. I know some of you are gonna complain about that. 20 round magazines that are straight. You'll notice they're not curved. We'll talk about the curved mags versus the straight mags a little later in the video. But let's do some shooting with the gun. We have some SNB 10 millimeter ammunition loaded into it, 20 rounds. On top, we have this classic Bushnell hollow sight that predates the EOTEX. And uh, we thought it'd be kind of fun to stick it on here just so you guys could see this old girl working. Uh, this is probably made before many of you watching this video were born, perhaps. <laughs> it sucks getting old. But let's see how the old Strebog shoots. That is very pleasant. So 10 millimeter has the power of say a 357 Magnum, a nice warmly loaded 357 Magnum. So you have 20 rounds of essence of 357 Magnum ammunition on tap in a self-loading PCC like this. This is an SBR, but uh, it's being imported by Global Ordnance and Gun Zone Deals is where I found this. Gun Zone Deals turns out to be an Indiana-based company. So anyway, that's how I came about it. I had to wait a little bit longer than other folks because I had to wait for the paperwork to clear so I could take possession of it. But let's take a closer look at the Strebog 10 millimeter. It's called the SP-10A3. A lot of folks ask me, how can I get involved in the firearms business in that particular community? And one of the best ways to do that is to become a gunsmith. Every gunsmith I know is just overbooked with work. It's a very good living. And so if you would like to become a gunsmith, you need to go to a gunsmithing school or become an apprentice for an existing gunsmith. But Modern Gun School is an accredited college that also works with veterans in the GI Bill, where you can go and get a degree from accredited college in gunsmithing and then go out and start your own gunsmithing business, which I think is a really great option. Again, throughout my entire life, gunsmiths have always been able to earn a really good living, assuming they have a really strong work ethic. So please check out Modern Gun School. I do have a link in the video description below. It just runs out of ammo so quick. <laughs> Need a drum. The recoil impulse on this thing is outstanding. It's AR style trigger allows me to shoot it very quickly and accurately. Yeah, it, the ergonomics are really, really nice on the gun. The non-reciprocating charging handle doesn't get in the way of my C-clamp, if you will, over the receiver. Yeah, very nice, very pleasant 10 millimeter to shoot. I don't wanna spend a whole bunch of time going over the Strebog 9 millimeter, 10 millimeter PCCs because we've done videos, quite a few videos on the gun in the past. Uh, we talked about the magazine issues of the early guns, things like that, and then how they went to the curved mags, which resolved all the problems I had with the nine millimeter versions. And then the 10 millimeter came out and other cartridges will be coming out here soon, I would imagine. But the 10 millimeter is the one that I like most. I'm just so happy to see 10 millimeter finally starting to come back into play. I have nothing against 40 Smith & Wesson. I like to crack jokes about it, but it's a fine cartridge. I just prefer the 10 millimeter because it has more potential in terms of power. And so the Strebog SP-10A3 is basically the exact same gun as the nine millimeter. So the internal dimensions, the stocks and things like that are gonna fit between the nine and the 10. The internal dimensions are the same. The only real difference dimensionally between this and the nine millimeter version is that the receiver is just a little bit longer. 
So again, stocks and things like that that you would have picked up for your nine millimeter will work on the 10 millimeter. That only difference being that slightly longer receiver. But they made a few other changes, evolutionary changes, I'm assuming, that may be rolled over into their other product lines. I don't keep buying Strebogs to find out what changes they've made. And so uh, Gunzone Deals did send me this pistol, uh, not a pistol, this one's actually an SBR. They did send me this, this SBR to do a video with to get my honest opinion about it. So here we go. Let's talk about it. First off, let's just talk about from the rear of the gun all the way to the forward. Uh, portion of the firearm. Now, most of you are going to buy it as a pistol and perhaps form one it down the road uh, and turn it into an SBR, or perhaps you'll put a brace on it because as of this recording, braces are legal once again. And so the pistol version is going to be the most common version. Let's just get the 800-pound gorilla in the room addressed right off the bat. The original uh, SP9s, A1s, A3s, the original 9mm versions were very attractive to a lot of American gun buyers because the prices were really low comparatively to other firearms on the market. So $650, bucks, $699 for a 9mm version. The 10 millimeters going to double that. $12.99 is about retail for this gun. So literally it's twice as much as a 10 mil or a 9mm. So the 10 millimeter is more expensive. And I know that's going to turn some of you guys off. But in the realm of 10 millimeters, it's not like we have a whole lot of choices. More and more every day, it's not like we have a whole lot of choices for a PCC. And so having shot this thing quite a bit with different types of ammunition. I, I am willing to say that I, I really like the way the gun functions, but let's let's talk about some of the features. Now, because this is an SBR, I have a stock on it. Again, the pistol will just have a pick rail in the rear so you can affix a brace and maybe a stock down the road, but the end cap comes off, which we'll talk about during field stripping. Now, this is an F5 stock. This thing has found its way onto all sorts of guns. We've done videos talking about this stock system. Uh, this is not the uh, correct stock that would have uh, Grand Power would have designed. I would have preferred to have had that stock. It's just a fixed stock, and I can show you a picture of it that folds to the side. This one is adjustable length of pull. It's very much in the same design vein as, say, an ACR stock from Bushmaster back in the day. The only difference is these stocks are just flimsy. They, they flop and bend very easily. Uh, they rattle. And, and they're just, there's just not my ideal stock. So if I was going to put a stock on this, I would go for the Grand Power stock. It's very narrow, kind of, it's just a good looking stock. But this gets me by probably because those aren't currently available in the United States. This has a cheek riser, stuff like that, adjustable length of pull. Uh, very, again, very much similar to the ACR. Moving forward, you'll notice we still have a pistol grip that is molded into the lower. Uh, one of the changes I know many people have said they'd like to see uh, on future iterations of these guns would be a grip that you could swap out, like an AR-15 style grip. So you could put any type of grip that you want onto the gun. With that being said, this is a very ergonomic grip. I have gigantic hands, but this gun feels really, really good to me. The trigger on this gun, very much like an AR-15 trigger, uh, has the same break. It's very easy to shoot quickly. It's a very nice trigger. We have Ambi selector lever that is present on both sides. Very low profile, but yet even though it's very low profile, I have not had any issues accessing it and, and hitting it and getting it to do what I want it to do. Now the lower is polymer, the upper is going to be metal. Here we have uh, an ambi mag release. I actually have a three-point mag release. So you have a button on either side of the firearm, but we also have the flapper, which I really like, right? So when you want to strip a magazine out of the gun, for many of us, it's really quite natural just to grab, pinch, and pull versus reaching down. Now I have long fingers. My finger is going to make it to that mag release very easily, but people with shorter hands may have to break their grip. So having that flapper there makes a whole lot of sense. So I really think that's well designed. The magazines themselves, I'm told, are based on an HK design. Now these are 20 round magazines. I know some people are going to say, wish we had 25 or 30, I get it. Uh, but keep in mind, it's going to add weight. And it's also going to add length. And you know, just as, as a complete package, this 20 round mag actually looks pretty darn good on the gun. Uh, we do have a 1913 monolithic rail across the top, so this is one long extrusion. So uh, this is solid to put all sorts of aiming devices, and, and you know if you want to put a peck or a laser or light source out here, it's very rigid because again it is a monolithic rail. Now one thing you're going to find that isn't ambi, you have the ambi fire controls, ambi mag release, we don't have an ambi bolt stop bolt release over here. Over here we have something that I would say is uh, similar, right, to the AR-15, it's similar in location, so when the gun locks open you just insert a fresh magazine push i'm pushing against the follower there and it'll strip around conversely you can push on the bottom and also lock the bolt open manually two pins 
we'll take the gun down. We'll do that and talk more about that during field stripping. Out here on the sides, we have M-lock rail sections, 1913 rail on the top, 1913 rail at the six o'clock, and then M-lock over here. So we have plenty of places to mount accessories. Nine by 16 thread on this, and I do have a suppressor on here, but it'll come with just a simple thread protector, which I've already lost. I'm really good at that. So that's pretty much everything in a nutshell. It does have a non-reciprocating charging handle, so you can fire the gun and not have to worry about inducing a malfunction by the charging handle hitting your hand and during disassembly. It's very easy to set it up when you're putting it back together, take the charging handle out and move it over to the other side of the gun. So if you're a lefty and you don't have this bolt stop bolt release over here, you still have the ability to put the charging handle over here. So stick a fresh mag in and just pop the charging handle and there's your bolt release. So overall, I would say the ergonomics are really good on the gun. Uh, it, it seems to have a good fit and finish to it. I mean, this isn't an H and K, this isn't a B and T, but the quality is, is certainly good at, at uh, I don't know, I, I have had problems with nine millimeters in the past, but it wasn't with the quality, right? So the finish on these is very, very nice. The fitment's good. The, this rear pin's a little bit tight. We'll talk about that. And I've been told why that is. And I think they may have remedied that a little bit on later versions. This is an earlier version of the 10 millimeter. But overall, I would say that the gun is a very good quality. Now, is it worth $1,299? That's something you're going to have to decide for yourself. At $699, it's an easy sell. I totally get it. 10 millimeters expensive, and this gun's twice as expensive as the 9 millimeter version. And I can understand some of you guys in the comments just blowing it up saying, oh, that sucks. I get it. But some folks will pay the $1,200 to get a 10 millimeter because they're like me, and 10 millimeter is the only 10 millimeter, or the only millimeter, I should say, that's worth owning. So some of you are going to ask, well, does the gun fire with the stock folded? Well, actually, yeah, it will, because when the stock folds, it folds to the left-hand side of the receiver. There's nothing really keeping it folded, so you can quickly pop the stock out like that. Um, but also, I should point out that, that it has that adjustable length to pull, but you also have QD mounts back here on both sides of the stock. If you want to run a QD in the front, you're going to have to get it an M-lock accessory to do that. So magazine changes on this gun. So the manual of arms is really simple. You have that forward charging handle, charge the weapon. I just have 10 rounds loaded. So it will lock open, last shot fired. You can simply just reach down, hit the button. The magazine will drop free. And when you insert the magazine, you can either hit the charging handle, as I talked about earlier, or you can just hit the release on the side of the receiver, much like an AR-15, and resume shooting. So let's take the firearm apart. Now, this does require a punch. I did bring this up to Global Ordnance, and they said that um, the reason this rear pin is so tight is because all the stock accessories and various accessories that have been made for the SP series, you know, 9mm and 10mm, over the years are all designed to work together. So it doesn't matter which generation you get, the stock should cross over. So there's going to be a little bit of fitment issues, but they did say that they've made some uh, drawing changes to this area. So this rear pin, perhaps in the future, because this is literally a Gen 1 gun, one of the first shipments uh, that came out, uh, the pin may be a little bit easier to get out, but I'm going to have to use a hammer and a punch to get it out. So let's field strip it. I mean, guys, there's nothing special here. Drop the magazine out. Make sure you do that first. Check the chamber. Make sure the weapon's clear. Point it in a safe direction and make sure it's unsafe. To take it apart, we have two pins, front and rear. The front pin on this one, I can literally just, just pop right out. I can do it with the tip of a nine millimeter bullet and you'll see how it, it loosens. Now you would think that that would make it easy to get this rear pin out. Uh, no, matter of fact, it takes considerable force on this particular gun. To drive that pin out. And it doesn't matter if it's just holding on barely. That sucker does not want to come out. So you literally have to punch it all the way over. But be careful in doing this because there is a little tiny C clip in there that keeps it from coming all the way out, which it's not supposed to do. All right. So you don't want to beat it to the point where it actually pops all the way out because then you're going to damage the little retainer in there. And so there you go. There's the lower receiver. Again, guys, there's nothing special here other than it's 10 millimeter. You can see that AR-15 style trigger in there. And uh, yeah, very familiar type stuff. To remove the stock or the end cap, if you just have the pistol, just kind of pull down a little bit 
And unlike other guns, it's not going to launch a bunch of springs in your face. That comes off very easily. Now you can draw the bolt to the ring. And typically I do these with the roller delay system inverted so I can kind of keep track of that little roller. And I'll show you why here in a second. Just pull back on the charging handle. That's all I'm doing, just moving the charging handle to the rear. Now at, at this point, because it's a non-reciprocating charging handle, you'll see that the bolt is independent of the charging handle. It can still move freely. That's part of the fact that, again, it's non-reciprocating. I'll show you how to take the, the charging handle out here in a minute, but then you just pull the bolt to the rear. And when you do that, this is what you want to be careful of. This is your roller delay system right here. So this, see how that little roller pops up? This would be in the locked position, if you will. And then when the gun cycles, it moves rearward. This will collapse, retract that roller and allow the gun to move to the rear and cycle. This little delay system is actually quite effective because 10 millimeters should be punchy. Again, it has the power of a 357 Magnum. This is a very pleasant shooting gun. Not much more recoil than a hot nine millimeter version of the gun. So it's very, very pleasant to shoot, very easy to shoot quickly. And that's all because of that slight delay system they've built into the design. So I do like that. Now to take it apart, this will just literally fall out on its own. So you don't want to take the gun apart with the receiver canted one way or the other because it'd be very easy to lose that in the dirt. And that's really all you need to do for basic field maintenance. Now, if you want to change this charging handle, just bring it back to where you see the opening is cut out just a little bit. Bring it back there, kind of wiggle the charging handle around, and then you can put it in on the other side. Literally that simple. When you go to put it back in, push it in, pull it back up just a little bit, kind of wiggle it around until it can move forward freely like that. Then you know it, you have it in. You can push it down too far and it won't go forward. Don't beat on it. Just kind of lift up on the pin until it moves freely and then it's inserted properly. And again, guys, that's all there is to it. Putting it back together is just re simply reversing the process. So I'm going to take my little piece, stick it in there like that. Take my little roller, slide it across. And I want that collapsed. And again, this will fall out very easily, so be careful when you're putting it back together. Put your first block in like that. Slide this one forward. Push her forward. Take your recoil spring. And you just have this big recoil buffer. This has changed quite a bit. There used to be rods over here and things like that on earlier versions. Now it's just a simple captive recoil spring. Insert that in. And again, it's nice that nothing comes launching out of the receiver when you take it apart. Put your stock on. You're just going to kind of set it in a little high and then push it down until it locks, and you can see that rear hole where that rear pin goes through. All right. Last but not least, set your trigger group and magwell on there, push your pins across. Now, I've tried oiling this and stuff, and it's just, it's just really, I mean, yeah, it's stiff. This one pops right in like it should. Now, over time, as things wear, this should get easier to take in and out. But uh, yeah, as far as fitment and finish and stuff like that, the only complaint I have is that rear pin just being a little bit tight. Other than that, a very, very simple firearm to maintain. 10 millimeter for the longest time was purposely downloaded. It was destroying handguns that weren't properly engineered, things like that. So over the decades, 10 millimeter really became 40 Smith & Wesson in many cases, especially the range ammunition. Now I shoot a lot of federal 10 millimeter and generally it works just fine in my handguns. As a matter of fact, I can commonly shoot actual 40 Smith & Wesson ammunition, which is just slightly shorter in overall length out of many of my 10 millimeter firearms and it works just fine. With the Strebog, you're going to want to run regular pressure 10 millimeter. I'm not saying you have to go out and buy Buffalo bore high pressure ammunition to get it to run reliably, but stuff like the S&B we're shooting out here today is warm enough where it's hotter than 40 Smith & Wesson and gives it enough umph to work the roller delay system. So here is some federal 180 grain range ammunition. Again, the velocities right around there with the same as, as 40 Smith & Wesson, but I have the Griffin armament suppressor on the end. It is a 45 ACP suppressor and it should give it just enough back pressure to cycle with the Federal. Then we'll show you how it doesn't generally work very well without the suppressor. All right, so that was with the can on. And it may mostly work. You'll just get, every once in a while, you may just get a little bit of a short stroke. Throw that there. Swap magazines here really quick. 
All right, so this is the same federal ammunition with no suppressor. So it's short stroked. So the suppressor gives it just enough back pressure to function. And we're just gonna start having malfunctions. So if you wanna use range ammunition with the Strebog 10 millimeter, uh, make sure that you just buy one box and test it to see how it functions. If you have a suppressor, I really wouldn't worry about it too much. It's, it's gonna work just fine with the suppressor with most of the 10 millimeter ammunition we've tried. So I mentioned earlier in the video that I would address the magazine design issue. Here we have a early first generation, at least for the US market, polymer Strebog 9 millimeter magazine. You'll notice it has polymer feed lips, no metal reinforcements. And in my early videos, I was very critical of this magazine. It would bind up, it would cause rounds just to shoot out randomly through the ejection port. We had all sorts of issues with the magazine. And apparently, Grand Power knew there were problems with the magazine, so they then released this magazine, which they sold to the owners, that has metal reinforced lips. And you can see the body of the magazine is even different. They messed with the geometry, uh, trying to reduce the amount of friction that a straight magazine has. Now keep in mind guys, a nine millimeter case may look like it has straight walls, it does not. The walls on a nine millimeter case taper. And so when you stack 30 of them, all with that taper in a straight magazine, they start to stack funny and create friction within the magazine. To overcome that, you can change the geometry of the follower, and you can also increase the spring pressure that it applies so much pressure that no matter how janky those rounds are stacked in the mag, it's gonna push past any of the friction. But having that type of a magazine spring, like you would find in an Uzi magazine, for example, or a Colt 9mm SMG, which is basically an Uzi magazine, the reason they work in their straight mags, they have a thick metal wall and a very stiff spring, and they can handle those pressures. Putting that type of a spring in a polymer magazine with these polymer feed lips, probably not going to work out too well. It'll eventually break those feed lips, which then came this magazine with the steel reinforced lips. These had problems too, which we documented. And then Global Ordnance designed a curved magazine that alleviated the stacking issue, and those curved magazines work flawlessly. They've, all of my 9mm Strebogs now work just fine with those 30-round curved magazines. So then you're probably going to ask, well, why are you okay with this magazine? This magazine uh, is very similar to the HK uh, UMP UMP magazine. And so the Germans figured out the follower, the stacking, the friction, and it may also have something to do with why it's a 20 round magazine. Maybe the reason we don't have 30 plus round magazines is because of that friction and stacking issue. I don't know, pure speculation, but these magazines work just fine. I've had no issues with them. So uh, if you're concerned about it being a straight mag based on my previous videos of the nine millimeter guns, don't be worried about it with the 10 millimeter. So far in our testing, the magazines are not a problem at all and work quite well. So it's interesting, they've made some evolutionary changes to the gun. One thing I did notice is that if you remember the original nine millimeter versions of the gun, they had little plastic sights that would fold down into the Picatinny rail. This gun has changed that. So the rear of the Picatinny rail, this is your V-notch for a rear sight. Then in the box, there's a little sight tool. And right inside here, there's a little front sight <laughs> that you can adjust for elevation. And so you basically look down the 1913 rail. Now this doesn't work with optics like the shield that I have on here now because you have a pin that goes across the T-rail that holds it in place, the screws do generally. So that's gonna block your field of view. But there are mounts out there that you can get that you would probably still be able to co-witness underneath the, the sight. Probably your best option if you wanna have backup iron sights would just be have a QD lever to get rid of a failed red dot optic or whatever optic you have on it so you could fall back to the integrated iron sights. I think this is more practical. It's certainly more durable because the original sites were polymer. I know companies uh, had sprung up to make metal ones to replace the plastic ones. So uh, that, we talked about the stock. I think that's about it. The overall fit and finish ergonomics, everything I actually like. The price I know is a little bit salty for many of you, but as far as 10 millimeter PCCs go, I really do enjoy the gun. Do I wish it would work better with Federal? Because Federal does support us here at the Military Arms Channel with ammunition, yeah, it'd be nice because so many other 10 millimeters will actually function with 40 Smith & Wesson ammunition or range 10 millimeter. But is that a deal breaker for me on this one? No, because s and is common. There's plenty of other, uh, the SIG ammo runs fine in this. There's other ammunition out there that isn't horridly expensive that will keep the gun running just fine even without a suppressor. So I can still shoot my Federal. I just gotta make sure I have the can on it. All right, guys, if you have any questions about 
the SP10A3 Strebog. You can ask those questions down below. I do try to stick around for the first couple of days after a video goes live to answer any of the questions you guys may have. If you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel so we can continue to bring you content like this, please consider becoming part of our Patreon family. Early access to videos, direct access to me, all sorts of good stuff. Link in the video description below. Right here on YouTube, you can support us with the either thanks or sub uh, subscribe button right underneath the video player you're watching right now in the age of demonetization. Thanks for watching. Please check out Copper Custom, and we will talk to you guys soon.